option. Um, and that you can do with the chats um, and the managed participants there, you can click on an option, raise hand. Um, you can use that at the end when we have a Q and A, um, or if you want uh, to answer a question, uh, which Carol asks you maybe. Um, so yeah, um, well, it's my pleasure, pleasure to introduce you all to uh, Karel van Oostrom. Um, he has worked in very different jobs. Um, he's worked in embassies from all over the world, like um, in Ottawa, uh, Damascus and Beijing, uh, which you may have already heard uh, just now. Uh, he's also worked as an advisor in uh, foreign policy and defense for the prime minister. And uh, since 2013, he's worked as the, rep the permanent representative uh, in the United Nations. And in 2018, um, he had a seat in the Security Council. Um, of course, he's also the author of the book behind him uh, with an orange tie a year in the Security Council. Um, so without further ado, here's Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much, uh, Eliana. It's uh, it's really an enormous privilege and a pleasure that uh, you've all taken your time tonight to uh, to have a conversation with me. Actually, uh, we had planned this uh, meeting, I think, three weeks ago uh, in the week that the book you see behind me was launched. And I was looking forward to have an interactive discussion with you. Uh, I think we planned it in Leiden. Um, uh, so we have to do this virtually. Um, um, uh, on my side, I have two of my closest colleagues you'll see in the call, Tessa Dicker and uh, Jan Antialiskan. These are the two closest colleagues I've worked with because usually we sit together in um, uh, a room the size, I would say, four by four. Uh, and we haven't met since like the 10th of March. So I miss my two closest colleagues and I'm happy you're with me here. And uh, one is in Brooklyn, the other is in Manhattan. I'm in Turtle Bay, so you're connected to New York tonight. Um, we'll try to do this with a video and a PowerPoint a little bit later on. I hope it works. We might have some technical difficulties, but let's try to stay connected. If it doesn't work, um, we'll try to do it without. And um, uh, usually when I do um, meetings like this, I do it interactively. And during uh, my, my talk, usually I ask questions to the audience um, that will not work now. Uh, because um, uh, the interaction will be more sequential. But what I will do is I have five or six questions in my, uh, in my uh, statement I will deliver, deliver. And afterwards, if you, uh, if you are gonna ask me a question, I challenge you to give an answer to one of the questions I've given during my speech. And I'll repeat them at the end and they're extremely complicated. So better prepare and you're not allowed to Google, but I cannot check it. Uh, as, as Eliana said in the back, you see the, my book. Uh, it's still only available in Dutch. Um, uh, if you have a, a father or mother who is a publisher in the English language, uh, rights are open. Uh, and the stupid thing is that uh, I do not have the book yet itself. Um, uh, FedEx uh, and uh, PostNL have not been able to deliver it here. So I'm, uh, I think it's a good book, but I only know it by writing it, but I haven't been able to read, read it as a book. Um, as Eliana said, we start with a short clip which shows uh, our year in the Security Council in 2018. It's about 1 minute 30 seconds, and then we start with the PowerPoint. Tessa, take it away. We start with the clip. I'm not getting any sound with the video. I don't know if anyone else is. I'm not getting, get, getting any sound either, but uh, when you're sharing the screen, you can go to a view option or... Uh, uh, it's, it's okay. It's, it's just, we, we meet, we're missing a very uh, uh, nice drum roll all the time, but this, this was the only real uh, sound which was below it. So we, we, we're good there.
gives you a little bit of impression of the things we've done and now I'll, I'll cover it in the PowerPoint. And you will see that we had a lot of political attention of cabinet members when we were in the council. And the big crisis which, which plagued the international agenda like Yemen, um, uh, like Yemen um, uh, were there. And this is the team we, we work together with. So that was a, a kickoff. And now uh, Tessa will try to start the PowerPoint. So about this year, I wrote a book, which is called With an Orange Tie, One Year in the Security Council. And it has a number of um, uh, narratives in it. Uh, first, what does it mean to be a diplomat? Secondly, what did we achieve in the Security Council? Thirdly, what does it mean to work in the Council, in the Security Council? And fourthly, maybe the most important, why does the work of diplomats matter for Dutch citizens? What is, what is in the interest of the, the people of Holland that we work so hard? Tess is getting warm there. <laughs> you were almost there, you were doing good. Yeah. Oh, oh so you can, I think we can all see this. So you can leave it like this. If it, this is even more beautiful. So we go to the first slide. Second slide, the next, slide. here we are, split term with Italy. Just a little bit of historical background. I know some of you study history. Um, we had elections for the Security Council in 2016. And there were in our regional group, three countries uh, competing for two seats. It was Italy, Kingdom of the Netherlands and Sweden. And Sweden was elected in the first rounds. And in the longest day of my professional life, um, uh, we ended up in a tie in the fifth round of voting, 95 against 95. This is the moment that with Minister Kunders and Minister Gentilone and later on with Prime Minister Renzi and Rutte who were in Brussels at the time, we concluded we would split the term and Italy would do it in 2017 and we would do it in 2018. This was quite unique uh, because this had basically uh, uh, only happened in the 60s. Next slide, please. When the end of the move in also this one, you see uh, uh, people uh, to, uh, to underline one point, which is that um, uh, working in the council is teamwork. Uh, so we had a team of about 35 uh, colleagues. Um, uh, try to imagine that the regular agenda of the council is around 65 subjects, which come up um, very regularly. And compared to the previous time we were in the council, there's three times more meetings of the council itself. There are three times more committees under the council and approximately three times more resolutions, press elements, press statements at the time as well. Which is my first question for you. Um, uh, write down the answer, write down the question, which is what is the last year we were in the council? We might try an experiment if anyone knows, unmute and tell me, and then we can go on or I can do it in the end. Anyone dares to say it? 2000. Well done, who's this? Aaron. Hi. You get one point. Thanks. Just <laughs> <keep> notes. <laughs> and this works, I love it. It's a little bit interactive. So 99, 2000 was the last time. Uh, unfortunately, the previous ambassador who served at the time passed away in December. So I'm the only living ambassador to have served in the council. That is to say that my deputy, which is Lisa Gregoire, you see on the left, left of this picture, also had the type, title of ambassador. And basically we had a, a duo bomb, um, a, a shared job. And um, as I said, this teamwork behind uh, uh, Lisa, you see Hedda Samson, who is our current ambassador in Bern with maybe the, the link pin, linking pin uh, function in the council, which is political coordinator. Then we basically work very closely together. Uh, we go to the next slide, Tessa, please. Uh, you know, the Security Council very often meets in the big hall where uh, we all read out statements which you can follow on UN TV if you're ever interested. Uh, since last week, uh, for six weeks, there was nothing to be seen because the council uh, uh, wasn't streamed anymore, now it's streamed again. Uh, but these meetings, which are in the, co the, the, the confidential uh, uh, consultations room, are secret, are confidential. 
So you cannot uh, be here. And this visualizes a little bit that 90% uh, of the work of the council is not visible. It's in these meeting rooms, it's in different meeting rooms, it's in our mission. And the really difficult negotiations take place here. And this is the, the sweaty room where it can get really hot. Um, we go to the next slide. In the video, um, in the video you already saw the prime minister. This is a debate in uh, uh, September uh, 2018 on uh, non-proliferation, where this is the famous moment where um, our prime minister uh, uh, walks past uh, uh, Trump and he says, hi, Mark. And then Mark says, hi, Donald. And I thought, God, these two people know each other. Uh, but it also visualizes with the word on top multilateral system. Uh, I don't have to tell you, you're all working in international relations. That the multilateral system at the moment is under pressure um, and certainly under COVID. And I'm looking forward to hear from you uh, how you see the multilateral system functioning. But a large part of my book is dedicated to the different roles the US has taken up in uh, the past couple of years, how the role of China has changed, uh, certainly compared to when I was serving in Beijing uh, in 2002, 2006. And now um, uh, also European Union without the UK has also a different uh, place in that constellation. Um, and maybe we go to the next slide. Um, uniquely is that we are a kingdom with four countries. And it brings me to my second question before I get to you uh, to explain what we're seeing here. Uh, the question is, is there a land border between France and the Netherlands? Uh, the kingdom of the Netherlands, I should say. Who dares to answer that question? Yes, I would. Uh, and and Sint Maarten. Well done. Bonus points for Dimit Bob. Bob or Dimitri? What's your name? It's, it's, Bo it's Bob Dimitri, but you can say Bob. Bob. Yeah. Or Okay, well, wonderful. Jalan is keeping track, so you're 1-1. One, one. Um, it's in Sint Maarten. That's good that you know it, because it's the first time I, I ask this question regularly. Most of the time, Nobody knows. They're like, no, Belgium is in between. Or you get an answer like, yeah, in Rijssel. But no, there's no border. So St. Martin, you're right. Have you ever been there, Bob? No, but I know it because um, I, I studied the uh, the Heineken ontvoering. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, the, the how do you say, the, uh, the people that uh, kidnapped uh, Freddie Heineken, they uh, actually had moved to France. Uh, to escape the, ne the Netherlands uh, from the, just uh, the Justice Department from the Netherlands. And then they uh, had a deal with France that they would um, exchange the criminals on St. Martin, because that was the only part where they actually uh -huh. were able to exchange uh, the kidnappers over there. I love this. I didn't know that. Uh, so I'm learning something as well. Um, so in in... Octo in the 10th of October 2010, 10, 10, 10, in the Kingdom of the Netherlands, we changed not our constitution, but we changed our st statute, that statute. And as of that moment, 10, 10, 10, in time, we have four prime ministers in our kingdom. So it's, uh, of course, Mark Rutte, uh, Evelyn Wever Cruz from Aruba. We go to the next slide. Leona Marlin, who is, uh, who is um, at the time was prime minister, but is now uh, not in office anymore and Eugene Ruggenaat from Curaçao. Um, in New York at the UN, this is a living reality because um, if you look at the division of responsibilities within the kingdom, about 40% of the agenda of the UN, like education or health or green energy, within our statute between our countries is a responsibility of the autonomous countries. So we have our colleagues from uh, the countries in the kingdom regularly over and as a good example, uh, you see Leona Marlin, uh, she opened her statement. This is a debate on peacekeeping in Haiti. Uh, um, uh, disastrous, so many uh, disasters have struck that country. And Leona started her introduction by saying 10% of the population in St. Martin is from Haiti. So everyone's like, hey, this is relevant. She knows her stuff. Uh, we had a lot of impact. Or for instance, uh, Prime Minister Ruggena talked about um, the implication of climate change for the security of small island development states. So this visualizes a little bit what you also saw already in the clip. We go to the next slide, Tessa, please. 
Um, when you go to the council, you have to make clear choices. On the one hand, you have the iron workload. Um, um, everyone has to the regular agenda, but to have an impact, you have to make key, uh, uh, very clear priorities where you really want to make a difference. We have three. We have prevention of conflict, peacekeeping operations, and accountability. On prevention of conflict, uh, maybe you saw last week the newspapers with uh, David Beasley of the World Food Programme uh, and also the Secretary General of the UN who warned for a, a major hunger disaster in the world. And there was a debate in the Security Council which was based on the resolution we pushed for and we realized it's one of the major achievements, a resolution which is called Hunger and Conflict which gives um, a, a very clear entry point for the um, humanitarian organization of the UN to put issues on the agenda, such as uh, the danger of enormous hunger uh, crisis at the moment. So prevention of conflict and especially the hunger issue was the first priority and also one of the most concrete results we had. The second pass, you'll see that on the, on the next slide. Um, uh, as a long story, I'll try to make it short. Working very closely with Secretary General Guterres, we worked on improving peacekeeping operations um, to make them more clever, more robust, and more accountable. Um, we profited from the knowledge we had uh, uh, gained in Mali. And in particular, this is when we visited with the Security Council, we visited Congo, where there's the uh, peacekeeping operation MONUSCO. And in my book, I describe how the force commander thanked us, not me, me, but all of the members of the council that because of the way we had cha changed peacekeeping operations, his job had changed, had changed. He explained that one year before he was counting bodies. And then he said, but now I'm saving lives. And there was a moment I thought we did make a difference. And the third priority, as I mentioned, was accountability. Um, here you see the breaking news uh, and with my, my Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, we fought very hard to get sanctions installed against human traffickers from Libya. Uh, and by having installed those uh, uh, sanctions, we were able to, to freeze their money, to get travel bans, and we really clamped down on human trafficking. And it, it kept people accountable. Um, who had, who had um, uh, done major crimes. So th that was a th third major priority and the third major result we achieved. And the next one, um, uh, maybe I'll, this is not a question I prepared, but does anyone know what a pen holder is? Of, can I ask anyone? Do you know? Let's see what your knowledge of what your knowledge is. Anyone dare to say what a pen holder is in the Security Council? If I'm correct, the pen holder is the one um, well, bringing the negotiation together and um, making sure that um, negotiation that's on the floor is actually you know, the negotiation that's possible. Aaron, you have two points. That is amazing. <laughs> no, very good. Very good. So this is indeed pen holder. One of the main sticking points in the council is that the permanent members uh, usually hold the pens on all resolutions. And that the, non, that the elected members um, uh, uh, chair the subsidiary organs, the, the subcommittees of the council. This one is the exception because none of the permanent members trust each other to hold the pen on Afghanistan. Uh, and so we worked very hard in the year before together with Italy that we would get the pen. And it meant that my colleagues, and uh, there were two uh, persons involved doing the negotiations all the time, like you say, holding the pen. Uh, who negotiated all issues on Afghanistan. And if you see these days, the political solution being created between the US and the Taliban, if you look at the resolution which was adopted in this session of the council, uh, the basis was laid there. Um, this was a very particular session because it was what we called an almost all female session of the Security Council. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, usually in the council, you have like 12, 13, sometimes 14 countries of men in the chair and hardly, uh, um, there's never, I don't, there's hardly ever a majority of women. We organized on the 8th of March an almost all female session of the council, uh, also to adopt our resolution, which had a strong uh, women, peace and security element in it, uh, but also for another reason. That's my next question. Why did, why did we do that on the 8th of March? 
Is it probably because it, it was International Women's Day? Well done, Frank. That is the 112 for Ireland. <laughs> so it was indeed International Women's Day. For me, it was a very nice moment because I was not allowed in the room. And I was upstairs amongst the journalists and the photogra photographers. And it gave me both a sense of alienation of that happening there, but me not being in the room. And at the same time, uh, from a distance, I could enjoy it much more. I just realized much more uh, almost physically what the difference was we were making. And very emotional. I was a colleague from a different mission who afterwards came to me and said, a female colleague who said, I was not allowed to sit in the chair. We have 13 female colleagues, but two countries weren't allowed to do it. But she'd never been uh, directly behind her ambassador. So she was in the second row. So also for her, it was a step forward. I mentioned the subcommittees which are being chaired of by the non by the elected members. We go to the next slide. Uh, we were allocated the most difficult and the most complicated committee, the one on North Korea. Uh, we have three priorities: uh, working to facilitate facilitate the political process, uh, and certainly the meetings between uh, North Korean leaders and American uh, politicians. Secondly, we tightened the implementation of the sanctions so to keep pressure on Pyongyang to, to enter in that political process. And thirdly, we worked very hard to prevent uh, unintended humanitarian consequences. And there's another question. Um, uh, in what place, in what Asian city did President Trump and Kim Jong-un meet for the first time? Uh, Singapore. Well done. Hehao, hehao, 1.4 Juan Yuli. That's well done in Singapore. And um, the, 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 the most beautiful thing was that my uh, the colleague ambassador from Singapore uh, handed me over a coin, um, uh, two coins actually, with both the images of uh, uh, President Trump and um, uh, Kim Jong un on it on both sides and uh, commemorative coins. And I gave them to my two colleagues who did all the work. So it's uh, they have this as a place of honor in their in their cabinet. Um, then uh, we go to the next slide. An important issue all through the year was to enhance the voice of the European Union in the Council. Uh, there was a parliamentary motion which told us to do that. Um, and some of you has no doubtedly have and have worked on European issues and have studied European law. What we initialed with our colleagues uh, at the beginning of the year was to have joint press conferences of the current members of the council, the previous ones and the incoming ones. We were lucky that we had five European member states in the council at the time. From, uh, so first of all, the, 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 the permanent ones, France and the United Kingdom, who was ten, still in the European Union, uh, Poland and Sweden. But what we developed in the year was a Troika format where the former members, in this case, Italy, which was the year before in the council, and the incoming members, which were Germany and Belgium, uh, because they were uh, uh, they had a clean slate during the elections. We had joint press conference on major issues, and this is why um, I will um, I became world famous, for instance, in Albania. My Albanian colleague uh, told me that when there was we did a press statement on Kosovo, I was live on Albanian television, and I got an email from my South African colleague. Uh, that it was live on TV when we had a huge um, statement on Sudan. And that's how we try to enhance our voice and by working better together, have more impact uh, for all of us. The trick question is, um, uh, how many European, mem European Union member states are now in the council? Does anyone know? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, how many European Union member states are now in the Security Council? Isn't it just one? Which one do you think it is? France. That's very good. That's one permanent member, but there are also elected members in the council. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Weren't there like four <laughs> Because I know Belgium is also part of the council right now. And I believe really? either Lithuania or Estonia, but I'm not sure. Estonia? And I how many? Like, did, yeah, I mean Germany did, too, right? Yeah. Really so four. how many did you say, Daniel? Or I was said it four. But, then you're good there. 
Yes. So it's four at the moment because the UK has moved out. Uh, that's really, uh, uh, well, that's, that's a fact of life. And in later this year, I'll become ambassador to London. So I'll try to, uh, to work as closely also there, what I can do with the UK. But uh, for the impact of the European Union, that has, um, uh, uh, we try to still work together as much as possible with the UK to make sure we have impact for peace, justice and, uh, and security issues. Um, the funny thing is, and why is this so important? Uh, every year we have elections for the council um, and in Europe, the European Union is, uh, has members in three groups, in the Western European and other group, uh, that's basically, uh, 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 well, this Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand. But we also have 10 members in the Eastern European group, uh, like countries like Poland, which you see here, or Estonia, as you just mentioned. Um, and then Cyprus is in the Asia group. It also means that there's, with the UK having left, only France on a permanent base in the, in the council. And it depends on the elections, uh, whether uh, there's another European Union member. And for instance, this summer, uh, and Tessa is our election officer. We still have to see whether, when it will go on. We have elections for the Western European other group. There's Norway, Canada, and Ireland. If Ireland does not win, uh, then there's no EU member from the Western European group. And next year there's elections in the Eastern European group and then Albania as a candidate, which is not a member of the EU. It would mean that in two years time, so in 2022 for a year, France would be the only European Union member in the council. And it's really something which, which is not um, um, a good thing. So we are trying to, uh, to uh, do our utmost to prevent that, that situation. This is just a short introduction on our year in the council. Uh, if you want to hear more, uh, read more about that year in the council, if you want to um, uh, read about um, uh, the relationship between pop music and diplomacy, um, if you want to read what the Mieke Telkamp model is when you want to organize something, if you want to read about the lessons learned for younger diplomats during that year, and um, if you want to know about the importance of football in the Security Council and our di diplomacy, read my book, uh, is my advice. Available at ball.com. And this is my Twitter website and email. Make a screenshot and you can, uh, you can follow me and connect with me. So this opens the moment for the Q&A session. Well. Thank you so much, Carol. Normally we would applaud, but that's kind of hard when we're all uh, on mute. <laughs> um, so I actually have a few questions of you and I think the first one you will get all the time. Um, why the orange tie? Shall I take them one by one? Is that what you want? So also uh, now we can take well, I, I, whatever you want, we'll do. The, I, we'll start with the easy ones. Uh, then, if it becomes more complicated, then I'll take them two or three at a time. Then I have more time to, to think. Um, uh, in the United Nations, there here in New York, it's the only place in the world where 193 governments are constantly talking to each other, and that means that the community of ambassadors, 193 ambassadors, is crucial because in a very small place we can very easily connect with each other. At the same time, 25% of the colleagues leaves per year on average. On average, a posting is four years, which means that all the time people are like, God, who is this guy? His name was Carl, but was he from Sweden? Oh God, he's blonde. No, it might be Norway. And then they see my orange. Carl Skow, off. then it's Swedish. Sorry? Carl Skow? Yes, Carl yes, Skow is the Swedish. And even uh, I had the honor to meet uh, King Carl Gustav, and my name is Karel Jan Gustav. So I said, I'm named after you, which was by chance. But, uh, no, so it's um, uh, the orange uh, uh, really helps with identification. Uh, we have enormous brand um, uh, awareness when it comes to orange. And basically, I'm also very proud to represent my country. So I, in my work since 2014, I almost always have an orange tie. And in honor for you in my book today, I also have an orange tie, but usually from home, as Tessa and Jana know, no tie. Good question. Next one. Um, yeah, that's actually two questions. Um, 
what is your biggest achievement, do you think, in your year in the Security Council and the biggest disappointment? Oof. Um, I've lived in, in Damascus. So you said that in your introduction in Syria in 92, 96, um, at a time that there was a, a relatively prosperous, stable country. Uh, you can say a lot about stability, but um, uh, and I went, I was also uh, accredited to Lebanon, and there it was just recovering from the war, and Beirut was one big um, bombed out mess. Um, uh, but Syria for me is, is in my heart because I've lived there for four years. It's very emotional. And um, we had hoped that we could work in the council on accountability to get a resolution to uh, refer uh, all war crimes in Syria to the International Criminal Court. It was vetoed by Russia. We had hoped we would be able to um, uh, get uh, accountability for chemical weapons in Syria. And we failed because Russia um, vetoed also that resolution. Um, at the same time, what I really appreciated, and that's maybe both my, my low point and my high point in that year, uh, certainly from a personal perspective, uh, we worked very hard, and Minister Block personally worked very hard when it comes to uh, the chemical weapons investigation. When that investigation was killed by Russia in the Security Council, um, my colleagues took it in The Hague, took it to the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, that's it. And there, Russia has no veto. And uh, the, I, let's say we had more than two third majority to make sure that OPCW did the investigation and made sure. And I think two weeks ago, the report came out, uh, which made very clear that um, it, or who had used the chemical weapons. So that was maybe uh, the other side. Um, I'm trying to, to think of another, one of the best moments, but read my book is where at the beginning of the year, uh, together uh, with all members of our team, we sing a, a song on the tune of Mieke Telkamp's um, um, uh, Waarheen Waarvoor, uh, which is a, a song written in Dutch about our year in the Security Council. Because I think together with the team, we also had a lot of fun. Uh, we try to enjoy it. It's once every 20 years, maybe, uh, um, that you're in the council, it's, it's a privilege. Uh, and uh, maybe also advice to you, if you do the, those kind of jobs, once a day, take 30 seconds and just think, wow, I'm allowed to do this, this I'm, I'm privileged. <laughs> Next question. Okay, thank you. Um, if other people have a question, you can click on the option, raise your hand. Um, I see Mitchell already has a question, Mitchell. All right. Um, so the uh, Security Council is within the international relations a uh, big discussion point. Uh, everyone says the United Nations is flawed uh, and the Security Council is uh, the biggest example of that uh, because the um, veto system and the five permanent representatives um, are a disbalance in international relations. What is your opinion about that having served in the Security Council? Uh, so that's a very pertinent question. Um, it's a discussion uh, that we've been conducting here in New York for at least 20 years, since the last, uh, at least since, the, the, yeah, about 20 years ago. Um, and, um, well, let's say a number of things. First, there's an enormous paradox already since 1945 that the veto blocks um, uh, any decision of the council which would go against the core interests of the countries who have the veto. So that limits in itself the power of the council. The paradox is there that the veto also means that you have ownership of that decision-making mechanism amongst the most powerful countries in the world, which uh, at the time were the P5. The, so France, Germany, sorry, France, UK, US, China, and Russia. The problem these days, uh, and that's certainly Mitchell what you're referring to, is that there are so many countries which now ha have also become enormously powerful, uh, India, Japan, Brazil, South Africa, to name just a few, uh, uh, Germany, of course. Um, and um, there are many countries uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the community of nations which think they should also have more upgraded status in the council because they have so much to offer, certainly in, in soft power, but also in, in, in peacekeeping elements and other things. Now, the problem there is 
uh, that uh, certainly from the perspective of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, we think a reform of the council is necessary. The problem is if you look at the decision-making procedures which are laid down in the charter, uh, it's extremely complicated to change the charter because the charter basically, can we call it the Constitution of the United Nations, that stipulates that to first, in it says who are the permanent members and what does it mean. But secondly, it also has as, uh, 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 as proceeded to change the charter and to change the status of the P5. It has uh, two um, uh, locks on the door. The first one is uh, that a two third majority in the General Assembly, so roughly 129 countries should agree. And secondly, that uh, also the Security Council should agree without a negative vote by one of the permanent members. Uh, and in my book, I call this, it's uh, asking a turkey whether uh, he wants to be uh, slaughtered, he wants to be killed for Christmas, he will say no. Uh, and it means that uh, countries like, um, uh, we have a Chinese colleague there, um, country like China doesn't want India and Japan as permanent members in the council. So they're against that. I, I saw that very closely when I was functioning uh, in China in 2005 and things were moving. Or if you talk about Brazil, countries in that neighborhood like Chile and Argentina don't want them to, to go to the council. And the same applies to like a country like Germany. So I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic. I'm, in my character, I'm optimistic, but I'm not optimistic that both two third majority and the, the passing of uh, five vetoes will be possible in the near future. So we'll have to, uh, how do you say that in English? We have to roll with the, well, Mitchell, your team knows how to say it in English. How do you say roeien met riemen die je hebt? I have no idea. <laughs> but thank you for your answer. Uh, it's very informative. <laughs> okay, so does anybody else have a question? I see uh, Maureen. Unmute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, first of all, for all the information. And uh, I'm very interested outside of uh, the current days we have now due to uh, the coronavirus, what, was, what does a normal work day look like for you? And also what advice would you wish someone had given you at the start of your career? Wow. Um, the, the first question is an excellent question. Uh, um, uh, actually, it's a chapter in my book which I had to cut out because it was too long. Uh, I have a very regimented existence, normally. Uh, a, a normal schedule in a week starts with what we call working breakfast, which takes place between somewhere 8 o'clock and quarter to 10. Then from 10 to 1, we have formal meetings at the UN. Between 1 and 3, we have working lunches, uh, informal meetings somewhere, usually in the in residence or a mission. From three to six, we have uh, formal meetings at the UN. Then between six and 7.30, uh, we have um, uh, national uh, uh, day celebrations where you meet each other very quickly informally. You can just check up on the latest information. And then uh, working or social dinners from, I would say 7.30 to 10 o'clock. Fortunately, this is not the schedule every day, but it's a schedule where you have at least two or three of each event planned in the week. And the way I survive those kind of days is uh, Janan is somewhere in the call. Uh, I don't see her. Ja yeah, there's Janan. Janan, that's why I'm so reliant on my, my colleagues, because uh, she manages my agenda, she sets my priorities, and she make, I'm, a, I'm a terrible um, uh, um, a paper shuffler. I lose everything. So Janan manages me and manages the information flow in our office. But certainly in the council, it was extremely busy. Then I, we were working from early morning to end of the day. Um, what advice would I love to have had? Or can I turn it around? What's the advice I would love to give you? Yeah. Uh, Perfectly. Um, well, I see the first advice I would give to you is become a board member of uh, DUNSA or the SIP uh, uh, in Dutch. Uh, there's so many of my colleagues who have been active in SIP or in DUNSA in the past couple of years who, uh, who joined the service. So uh, work hard, study hard, uh, but also work on your social skills. 
don't become a nerd uh, because a large part of her work is also making connection with other people. Um, and this is, sounds a little bit like self-promotion, but I really try to write my book uh, also with the next generation in mind. Mm -hmm. um, like there's a whole chapter on uh, intercultural skills and different sense of uh, how you interact with different cultures. And uh, the, so there's a, a chapter on a book by von Stompenaars, for instance, and there's also Hofstede. If you have not read their books, uh, read their books, and then you understand how it, how uh, how different it is to work with people from 192 different countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the second book I heard, uh, Hofstede, but the first one, what was that other? Von Stompenaars. Von okay. Stompenaars. Uh, if in, in my book I give the title, I, I don't have oh, the Okay, of, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, on to the next question. I don't see any raised hands. If you don't know how to do it, you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. <laughs> Okay, I have a question then. Um, how much contact do you have with The Hague on a daily basis? How much um, well, leeway do you get to decide your things yourself? Or are, are you, you follow direct orders from the minister? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, um, compared to 20 years ago uh, and Basically, I, I wrote my book because most of my predecessors have done the same. If I read through the old books, um, uh, one of them is called The Hague Never Answers. Uh, this is a book from the beginning of the 50s where uh, you would send out a cable, you wouldn't get an answer from The Hague and you were left out there on your own. What modern technology has really enabled, uh, and there's also a huge uh, change compared to 20 years ago, last time we were in the council, is the, the complete connectedness of our work. Um, uh, and that's even more visible in these COVID-19 times. Uh, uh, like Tessa is here uh, uh, at the other side of the East River. Uh, uh, and then Eliane here is somewhere in Leiden and ISO is in Utrecht. Uh, but who, who could tell? We could also be uh, all of us in this building. So uh, because of that connectedness, um, the whole policy making process in which used to be the Hague in the ministry, you would develop a policy and you would send out an instruction to a, um, a, an embassy or a mission at the UN. But these days it's much more really integrated process. Um, uh, and very simple, when we're in the council, uh, for instance, if there was a discussion in Burundi, um, we had an intense uh, informal network between uh, my two colleagues who were doing the issue in New York. We had the experts at the ministry and we had uh, the people in the uh, embassy in Burundi and then even in Addis Ababa where the African Union was working. And modern diplomacy is for in, 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 the, in the back office for a large part making sure that that connectedness is there, that communications are called for and you get an integrated um, uh, yeah, an, an, an integrated set of information on which you can make your uh, policy decisions. Um, of course, all the work we did was on the political responsibility of our ministers, uh, even sometimes the prime minister. Uh, and for that, we had a very simple system, which we call the, the traffic light system, uh, red, uh, orange, and green. If it was green, it meant it wasn't politically very sensitive and then the, the technical advice, basically, which was based on that golden triangle, um, uh, you know, the, the, the political director could sign off or even lo uh, lower level in the day. Uh, orange was a little bit more sensitive. Red, um, very politically very sensitive issues, like an easy example, Middle East peace processes, very sensitive in, in the Netherlands, in our parliament. It meant that then uh, the minister personally had to sign off. At the end of the day, um, uh, we were we are, we advise our political bosses, uh, and they in the end decide whether they follow our advice or do something different. It's a very integrated process, and completely different than than 20, 30 years ago. Thanks for that question. 
Okay, then on to the next question. I see Iso raising his hands and then Mitchell. Yes, uh, I was wondering what's the relation between countries within the council like? Because while well, the Netherlands is quite small and only there for a brief period of time, uh, working together with countries such as uh, the USA and Russia, which are big military powers in a, in a permanent uh, place in the council, does that influence the ways you work together? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to do self-promotion. Read my book is my first answer. <laughs> no, this is, it's an excellent question. No, it's, it's really excellent because um, uh, um, being in the council is a lot about power and influence and how do you maximize your own influence. So uh, my, first, my first answer is quite simple. You have to build coalitions. And for us, it was relatively easy, as I mentioned, with five European Union members and um, you have your first group you have there. On most issues, contrary to what I sometimes read in the newspaper, um, the US is, uh, is very close to all major issues which are on the global agenda. There are some exceptions, uh, climate change, um, certainly Iran, JCPOA, but the vast majority issues in 2018, we had a solid coalition uh, with the US and we worked very closely together. Uh, at the other side of the council, you have uh, uh, Russia and China, where, uh, and I'm, I'm very interested what uh, our Chinese colleague uh, who's in, uh, in China at the moment, what his appreciation is. At the other side of the council, you have Russia and China, which I think have an informal agreement between the two of us. They will try to support each other on the major issues. Um, so then what is left is the middle group. The, uh, so six on the one side, two on the other. How do you influence the, I'm bad in math, that's seven, that's six left, eh, I think. Six plus three is eight, seven left. Uh, some of those in our times, like Peru, they were very close to us. Colum uh, Bolivia on the other side was very close to Russia and China. Um, what we try to do is build coalitions of substance. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, a major change in our year was that we were very closely what used to be called non-permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, uh, it's a negative word, eh? non-permanent member. I didn't like it and uh, none of us liked it. So we changed it into elected members of the council. And in our year it became the E10 in instead of the non-permanent file. You know, it's non-permanent. It's a negative identity, it has to be positive. And elected is what we are. We are elected by the General Assembly and the permanent members get their votes, their, per their permanent seat, with plus their veto from Second World War in 1945. We get our power, our influence based on, on our election. What was installed during our year, and we were part of that group, uh, but it was really a lead by all 10, was we tried to really meet um, uh, to, to also as a group of 10. Because we found out in the council that the permanent members had a monthly lunch with the Secretary General. We were never invited for that luncheon. So then we said, and it, I think it was my colleague from Peru who did it for the first time, he said, he'll invite the Secretary General as well. He cannot refuse us. So we had almost every month, we had lunch with the Secretary General to talk about the agenda, what was in it, on his mind. Um, uh, there's a separate meeting room. I didn't know that, but to the left of Security Council, a separate meeting room where only the permanent members are allowed in. Goodness. So we organized a different meeting room with the other side where we could meet informally. And we tried also to use that E10 a group for, um, I would say, uh, really cross-cultural, cross-political agendas, issues like humanitarian access, humanitarian relief, uh, humanitarian assistance. Um, so we had to build coalitions. Uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, if you have seven elected members who vote no, it's a veto because you, for it to get a resolution then you need nine votes. So if you organize yourself very good, you have a lot of influence. And it doesn't come easily, but um, uh, a lot is about uh, making coalitions. A lot is about knowing the procedures. We were blessed with, uh, with certainly Hedda Samson who was an expert on all procedural issues. It's very often that there are permanent members who will say, we don't do this in this way. And you must know what the formal rules are. But it's also a battle of wits. It's about ideas. Who has the right idea? Who has the right moment? Who has the right initiative? Thanks right. for the question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the answer. Okay, then we will move on to Mitchell. 
So to, you've told us a bit about your career and where you've been, um, but to get to a position that you are in now as a, or you were in as a, per, as a representative of the Netherlands in the Security Council, that takes lobbying at the highest level, I would imagine. Um, so how does the process go uh, to become the permanent representative for the Netherlands in the United Nations? My goodness. Uh, in my case, it was Minister Frans Timmermans who asked me, um, Karel, uh, that was in 2012, uh, come into my room. Then I was political uh, director general politics zaak, so his highest foreign policy advisor. And he said, I've looked through the team and the, he was looking for a profile of someone who could on the one hand campaign. So you need someone who's very extrovert, maybe uh, very social but also someone who can play power politics in the council because he wanted someone to be there for six years. And he looked through the, the possible candidates and he looked at me and he said, you're the one, are you interested? Uh, so that was the process. Um, if you look at my profile more in general of the past 30 years, I combine, I've been about, by now I've been 50, 50% both in the Hague, in the ministry and the prime minister's office and 50% abroad. And like I've lived in China for four years, it helped me enormously. The current Chinese colleague is an old friend since 2002. Lao Panyo is our Chinese colleague will understand what I'm saying. Um, when we talked about Syria, uh, I know the Middle East inside out because I've lived and worked there. Um, and in The Hague, I've had, the, yeah, I can say the, the, the most difficult jobs in foreign policy field. So um, yeah. But I was completely surprised when I never thought of it when I mean, my minister said, I need you in that place. So it's also a bit of luck, maybe. Uh, and what has helped me enormously in the seven years I've been here is I've worked very closely with all ministers involved from all parties. And I was um, foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Rutte when he started. So I know him personally as well. Um, and so... Um, there's also political trust in me uh, so far. So, inshallah, that will continue. You're muted still, Eliana. I'm sorry. I see Frank has raised his hand. Yes, uh, I had a, que a general question about the combination of uh, studying um, and uh, other skills that you can do or like, you know, can uh, develop while you're studying, for example, uh, doing a board year or other social activities. And I was wondering, um, because you already were talking about it previously, um, to what degree do you think um, a study or a specific type of study can actually help you uh, get to uh, where you want to go. So for example, in this case, maybe it's good to take your own position. Um, and I was also wondering exactly, because I know you studied uh, here in Leiden, but uh, what did you exactly study and how did that all go? Like, I'm one, just wondering what kind of process did you go through to get here and then with the, uh, well, focusing on your study. Okay, uh, oh, that's nice. It's, it's a very, um... The second chapter in my book is about this one. Uh, I hadn't included it, and then my publisher said, you have to make it personal. So this is about how I joined the Foreign Service. Uh, when I began to study in 1976, um, uh, I think the labor market uh, was bad. It, uh, and studying was really about um, an expression of yourself, not of what, who you wanted to become. And I was extremely interested in history and economy. Uh, and when I finished my gymnasium, uh, I'm abs I absolutely suck in anything to do with uh, 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 math or algebra. Or So my final package was six languages and history. So I don't think there was any other option than to study history. Um, uh, but I was very much interested in economy. And uh, so that, that was the mix I had. And in my book, I, I write about the moment in 1980 two where uh, I met my girlfriend uh, at the time uh, with whom I'm now married since 1984 uh, but in 1982 there was an article in the Volkskrant which talked about the new di diplomat which was exactly your question what, what do you have to do what, what must be your skills and it said you have to acknowledge about international relations certainly also history 
you need to be able to speak three modern languages. You have to know to be aware of economy and everything involved and also have cultural affiliation. And I never thought about becoming a diplomat. When I'd read it, it was like, geez, that's me. I really felt like this is about me. And more important, I said this to my girlfriend and she said, I'll go with you. Uh, and uh, first I went to military service uh, and then I was accepted at the ministry. We got married and this has been a project for the two of us. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you, me find a partner who wants to come with you, but uh, in my case, it really has helped. Uh, it has made me extremely happy. Uh, but if you want to, if you want to become a diplomat, there's a lot of skills you have to have. There's a lot of knowledge you need to have and the ability, the skill to uh, get deep knowledge about a certain issue in no time. Um, uh, and at the other, uh, you must be able to interact with other people. And sometimes I see colleagues who come in who think this is all about substance and who write very detailed, um, uh, complicated papers, which is interesting and useful. It's what I call a diplomat also must be able to be two dimensional. Uh, so two dimension, make it simple. Uh, if we have a seminar in our mission, it's very nice if one of my colleagues is willing to make sure that um, the setup is okay and that everyone knows what to do and the sound is okay. I've, I've, I've moved a lot of chairs in my career. Uh, so if I can actually um, um, ask something now that I know that you uh, studied history, um, and uh, come back to my original question. Do you think it has, uh, it, that uh, study has significantly helped you with your career? Or do you think the other skills that you have, you know, gathered along the way have been of, of the utmost importance since that's something that a lot of students nowadays also uh, think about like, do I, hey, do I need to focus a lot on my studies or on those other skills? Yeah, this, this reminds me of the, the conversations I've had with my son. Uh, uh, Gustav, who uh, studied at UCU and then uh, Universiteit Utrecht and then ended up in Amsterdam and who's now in his third year as management trainee at uh, Randstad. And when he asked, he asked me, Daddy, should I study history? They said, no, 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 there's no job perspective there. You don't want to become a teacher in history. And then one day later, he came to me and said, Daddy, you're, at that moment, I was um, advisor to Prime Minister Rutte. So I said, Daddy, you've studied history. Prime Minister Rutte has studied history. And in that cabinet, Maxime Verhagen was Minister of Foreign Affairs, who had also studied history. So what do you mean? The three most important men in my life have studied history. So there's a career there. Um, the, the, the question is very specific. I think you need both. Uh, if I look at my son, uh, uh, when he was um, doing the rounds of uh, traineeships at major Dutch corporations, they all look at, on the one hand, what have you learned uh, in your head, but also what are your skills? And he was um, the chair, he was elected president of the board of UCU, um, the, the, the UN, what is it called? Uh, some of you must have been in UCU uh, or in a university college, it's the board which is elected by the pupils. And so he had a board here for a year and that helped it, it made him grow enormously. Uh, so grow, profit, and do what you like, and and uh, enjoy what you do. It, it's and grow. I think that's the most important thing. Okay, thank you. I see two questions. I also uh, look at the time. How much time do you have left, Scaro? Uh, Chanan will answer that question. Chanan, what I'm going to do next? You have about twenty minutes left, so you're good so to go. We're good to go. Um, let's uh, maybe take them both at the same time, starting with Justin and then uh, Kaisa. Well, thanks, Carol, for taking the time to answer our questions and for your wonderful uh, presentation. There are two questions that I would like to ask. First of all, I was wondering whether there's an opportunity uh, to get an autograph edition of your book. And my second <laughs> question is, aside from the earlier books that you've mentioned, I was wondering, what are your favorite books on diplomacy and why? God, that's impossible. Okay, um, let me, let me, first to get an autograph version, uh, this, this is really uh, adding insult to injury. I don't have the own, my own book yet. 
It's summer lost over the ocean. Janan has promised me that a colleague who came back yesterday has brought two copies. You'll have so. yours tomorrow. You're okay, good. so, so uh, uh, yes, I would love that. Uh, if we would have had a, a live session with all of you, I would, be, I would love to do that. Uh, send me an email. I will, I will write something on paper. You can uh, uh, put it in uh, uh, loosely in your book. And maybe one day we'll do signing sessions with all of you. God, which book should you read? I'm, I'm gonna, one second, I'm gonna look behind me. Sure. Um, it just disappeared. It disappears, in, disappears in his own <laughs> book. That's <Yeah>. funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm still here. Uh, it's impossible. I have I've, I have about uh, three meter of books of colleagues, old books. Um, uh, it really is impossible. What, what I loved is the Stille Diplomat, the biography of Max von der Stoel. Mm -hmm. I found it very inspirational. Um, um, and the biography of uh, Van Cleffens, the Netherlands Minister of Foreign Affairs in the one in 1945 who negotiated on the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do anything at the UN, there's one specific thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's I will I will I will show you. So one book is Act of Creation. Uh, I don't know whether I can see myself. Act of Creation, the founding of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing story about 75 years ago by Schlesinger. Actually, there's another book I really want to recommend uh, by a good friend of mine, Samantha Power, Education of an Idealist. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, in Dutch, it's called Leerschool van een Diplomaat. And as Tessa and Jana know, um, uh, uh, I helped her to get the right translation for the title. So I'm a little bit proud as well. Certainly Samantha book, Samantha's book, Education of an Idealist, really mm -hmm. sketches what our work is and how you match your ideals with reality and to not only change words on paper to make sure that what we're doing has impact on the ground to, to make the world a little bit more safe, a little bit more just, a little bit more prosperous for all of us. Well, thank you very much for those uh, four or five recommendations. And my own book, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> It's hard to, to pick your favorite book. Um, then we uh, continue with Kaisa. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure everyone has even heard about this, but media, I suppose, especially Swedish and American, have claimed that the UN withheld information about the Congolese murder of Saida Catalan and Michael Cha. And I'm basically just curious how it's like to like hear such scandalous news at your position in the Security Council. Yeah, um, I got back here. Um, there's many times in international press that the UN is accused of suppressing information, and certainly the two issues where you mention it. Uh, if you if you if you look at the records, if you look at the reports, I think I'm convinced that all information which is available has been made public. Uh, but uh, there's another issue if you talk about Sweden is the the killing of Dag Hammarskjöld in 19 the beginning of the 60s where uh, certainly in Sweden, there's still uh, a lot of action going on to get to the truth. Uh, and even uh, the UN professor in The Hague, uh, Elena uh, uh, McNally, uh, was here like half a year ago to do research in the files. So it, very often um, uh, the, the image the UN has in the media is, um, um, yeah, over trocken is a little bit exaggerated, maybe is the best word to say, as if there's a conspiracy here. There's much, much too many people from too many nationalities to keep anything secret. It all comes out. Uh, so I think it's a, re a relatively very open organization. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? I'm getting hungry seeing Mitchell and his team eating wonderful boiled noses. Gosh, ah, stay healthy, we cover better. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm coming over. 
if not the multiple hands um Eliana, i see i think louise if i'm not mistaken i see and bob and uh, one, two, i think yeah. they have the ones up isn't that stable um we can start with louise then bob and then juan Um, okay, well, my question is, how do you see the future of the UN? And a second question is, how does the UN deal with this pandemic? Um, maybe the, the pandemic first. Um, the second, if, if you follow me on Twitter, um, you will see that the UN has launched five major lines of action in the past couple of weeks. Um, first, um, uh, fighting COVID itself, where the World Health Organization is under enormous pressure, um, uh, is, is in the lead, but is also under pressure. So one, fighting COVID. Second, the Secretary General has pushed and is still pushing for a global humanitarian ceasefire. Um, you feel all a little bit locked up here in your homes in Holland. Imagine you were in a, in a camp in uh, the north of Jordan and you know, in a tent or um, uh, so the humanitarian situation of refugees certainly uh, is this, um, sorry, it's first to get a ceasefire is the second one, um, where an issue is that the Security Council is not able to come to a, to a resolution. Third, the humanitarian assistance, humanitarian relief for the people in the, in the refugee camps. Fourth, um, uh, to address the socioeconomic consequences. Uh, uh, in Holland, I think we, we're looking at, um, well, you see, reading news like I do, the, the economic uh, negative effects, socioeconomic effects of the crisis are enormous. And the fifth future oriented um, uh, uh, work of, li work of line of work the SG has identified is basically recover better, which connects to your first question. How do you see the future of the UN? The UN can only exist if uh, the member states want it to function. Uh, so if the relations between the, the member states are certainly the most important, the biggest one are okay, the UN will blossom. The more complicated the relationship is between um, the, uh, the major countries in the world, uh, the less able the UN is to function. And Security Council is a case in point. Uh, during the Cold War, um, the number of meetings was really, really limited. Uh, the number of resolutions was really limited. And we had about, uh, I would say, about 20, 25 years that the, the UN functioned quite well. And these days we can say we are under pressure. Uh, the UN system is under pressure. It certainly means what this means for Dutch policy. Um, my advice to my political bosses was and remains that we have to invest in the UN, first uh, on our own, but also with our European partners. Because for any Dutch citizen, we are so dependent on uh, other countries. You see it now. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, we had almost a quarter of a million people abroad. Um, we have uh, our economy, about one third of the jobs in Holland are dependent on uh, other countries. Um, so our wealth, our security and our health uh, is dependent on the, the world. So we better make sure that we have an international organization which ensures that there's one place where all countries of the world talk to each other. And I'm a diplomat and I served as a, as a soldier, so I will say it's better to start talking uh, before you start fighting. Uh, that's my personal vision. Yeah, that's clear. Thank you for the answer. Okay, then we continue with the question of Bob. Hello, uh, thank you very much uh, again for uh, uh, all your information so far. It was very interesting. Um, my question is, I'm reading right now into um, the Congress of International Religions uh, that is held in Kazakhstan every three years. And uh, they started somewhere from uh, uh, the 9-11 the, the attacks on uh, with the goal to establish more world peace but then from uh, the religion, religious point of view, by uh, finding uh, or religious leaders, how they can unite. And I was wondering, uh, I also read that they are right now with, busy with the UN as well. If you know anything about it and if it has any significance, because I never hear anything about it on the news, but it does sound very interesting. Um, have an intercultural uh, talk instead of an international uh, conversation? Uh, I don't know the specific Congress of the International 
Congress of International Relations, what we do see here in New York is what we call the Alliance of Civilizations with the former Spanish Minister of Foreign Affairs, I forget his name, who is chairing it at the moment. And that has exactly what you're trying, uh, what you described as the other uh, group is doing, which is trying to connect religious and, um, um, how do you say it, labels of fatting, views yeah. of um, religion and belief. Belief has a, a wider connotation. Uh, labels over time is the best word. Yeah. Uh, so that is happening. Uh, the regular meetings. Uh, we had, I think, a visit of the Pope in 2014 here, where he also spoke to other religious leaders. Uh, I'm a simple guy. I um, one of I, I especially believe in fundamental freedoms, the freedom to believe, to not believe, to be able to change your belief, or not to have a, a belief. Uh, and the more um, we've seen in the past that religion has all have also been a source of hatred and of conflict so uh, if religious leaders talk to each other and come to joint um, uh, appreciations that is that is good for real peace I, I just bought a different book by kim gattas i think it's called the black wave um, yeah kim gattas it's a dutch lebanese journalist and she's written a book about the, the Shia Sunni problem in the Middle East, where we see that religions are can be very, extremely complicated there. Uh, so uh, I love it when when religious leaders talk to each other, and, yeah, contribute to mutual understanding instead of mutual killing. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, then we had a question from Juan. Okay, I have a question about uh, globalization. And in this recent year, we see the Brexit and Donald Trump win the election. And also during this COVID-19 pandemic, more and more country think, uh, thinking about uh, uh, reform their supply chain. And my question is, you as a, a diplomat, uh, do you worry about this anti-globalization? And uh, uh, as a government officials, what's your suggestion to Dutch government for this new situation? I mean, the anti-globalization. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, at the moment, uh, if I look at the, uh, the reports of World Food Programme, um, uh, IFAD, uh, and even World Health Organization, one of the biggest worries about the implication of COVID-19 is uh, is um, um, that it might lead to new protectionism uh, and cutting off of markets. Uh, I'm a simple Dutch guy. I know how our economy profited from uh, trade, from international cooperation, from distribution, from logistics. As I mentioned earlier, uh, one third of our jobs are dependent on, the, on, on international trade, on investment. Uh, when I worked in Ottawa, when I worked uh, also in China, we worked a lot on investment promotion. Um, for uh, the health and wealth of our country, it's quite simple. We need open economies. We, we must fight protectionism. And also now in the current crisis, keeping um, uh, uh, supply chains open and uh, uh, is, is crucial for literally for our health and our welfare. Okay, then I think we're almost uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. Are there any important questions that you need to ask before uh, Carol has to go away? I see Mitchell. Mitchell, do you have a question for us? <laughs> What's your dream job? What were you dreaming of later on? I can answer that. That's Prime Minister of the Netherlands, but I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't say that out loud too much. I feel provoked. Um, when I celebrated in 1999 my 25 years of marriage, no, 2009, 2009, and our son was Master of Ceremonies, he had a pet you up, pet you off quiz. And one of the questions was, um, uh, 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 which uh, a lot of my friends didn't know, was, what did Karel want to become when he was 16? A famous writer or a prime minister of the Kingdom of the, uh, of the Netherlands? And most thought that I wanted to become a writer, but I, my dream was when I was 16 to become prime minister. If that's your dream, go for it. Uh, join a political party, work very hard. 
Uh, if you look back, uh, having become foreign policy defense advisor to the prime minister, it always felt like at one percent of my dream, I, I, I achieved it. And um, if I look back, um, uh, I've always been flexible in my dreams. So when I realized that there was no political party which would want me as their political leader, I thought, okay, I give up this dream. Uh, and I dreamed of becoming a diplomat, and uh, that happened. Uh, and I dreamed of becoming very happy with a beautiful, uh, uh, with a with a beautiful life and a beautiful wife, and that also happened. And then we were blessed with a great son, and he's doing well. And he's house hunting in Utrecht at the moment. So create your own life, and don't f don't only work, have fun as well, and work very hard. Goed je bammetjes kouwen. I think that's a very good advice for uh, every one of us. Um, I want to thank you very much for um, being with us and um, telling us about your life and your work. Um, I will certainly buy your book. I think it's very interesting and I'd like to know uh, more about what you've done. Um, and I also want to thank all the other participants uh, for joining us and uh, asking all the questions. Um, yeah, and I think we'll continue uh, with uh, online drinks with the people that want to. And uh, we have to say goodbye to Karel and his colleagues. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. I really appreciate it and uh, had a lot of fun. And uh, if you want an autographed paper in your book, let's let I make that promise. Um, I In my last slide, there was an email address or through uh, the four board members, you have our details. So just we'll, we'll send something. And I even have um, still paper left from the Security Council, if that works here. No, no I, I disappear. Uh, you will get a, a, a small a page of paper, which you can put into your book. I wish all of you good luck. Um, enjoy your life, work hard, and we'll get over the COVID crisis. And uh, enjoy the drinks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.